<laughs> Greetings, everyone. Pete Pardo here from Sea of Tranquility. We're ready to prog and roll here today, along with Stephen Reed from Scotland. What's up, my man? How are you? Yeah, I'm really good, Peter. Excellent. Uh, looking forward to this. Um, a fantastic assignment that we've got here. I'll let you explain what it is, but this has been, we always say this, how hard is this and how hard is that? Oh, Peter, how hard is this? So Yeah, yeah. And, and the reason why we, we were... We're, I just we were laughing about something before we decided to push the record button and sometimes it's good just to open up with a bang and just you know get the chuckle out but uh, anyway yeah this was not an easy task for either one of us this is basically a kind of a continuation of a show that we did here uh, a month or so ago where I did uh, like a uh, Italian prog rock primer. So basically for those who are looking to discover Italian prog rock, the, and, and I did 30 at the time, these are the 30 albums, whether they be old or new that you must hear uh, as, if you want to get into Italian prog. So Stephen and I decided because he is from the UK, right? He's from Scotland and I love UK prog as does he. Uh, I said, you know what, let's just do a similar type show on the albums that we each feel are essential to any UK prog rock collection. And especially if you are really not big on prog or never investigated the UK prog rock scene, if you haven't, I'd be surprised, but hey, you never know, right? Um, we've each put together a list of those 20 albums we deem essential. Now, let me just, before we start, this is not every single album that was ever released in the UK, right? Uh, as a, by a prog band. Okay, we also, that we understand there's lots of great, really underground albums and multiple albums by multiple bands that are deemed classic. The purpose of the show is not to list every single one of them because we're, you gotta limit it at somehow, right? So we each feel the 20 that we picked are our best recommendations for you to go check out, okay? So uh, let's get started. So I'm going to have Stephen kick us off with his, I guess we're going to go 20 to 1. And again, not necessarily, these aren't necessarily in any order of preference or chronological or, you know, I like these ones better than that. I, I know for me, the top of my list are probably my really favorite, but I love all these and that's why they're on the list. So for those of you watching, don't get hung up if one is at number 20 and you feel it should be at number three. I, just these are all amazing albums you need to have them in here that's that's where we're going to go here so in saying that Stephen's going to start off with his first uh, selection and in saying all that Peter you've said let's not go for obscure things and all of that so I've started with fantasy so it's just reasonably obscure okay so yes there's going to be lots of big boys in here there's going to be lots of bands that everybody knows and everybody loves okay so this is fantasy this is beyond the beyond, beyond. this is from 1974 this was the band's second album it kind of didn't really get released at the time i've obviously got a, a, a reissue here this is an album that, that i suppose some people would still call derivative but it sits perfectly between yes and genesis and i would suggest that from this era so you know mid 70s this is kind of as good as it gets from a band that you're not going to say well they were household names at the time um you've got paul lawrence on lead vocals uh, 12 string guitar peter james on guitar there's no household names here, but this is just a great prog album that sits between that kind of, you know, symphonic thing that, yes, we're so just, you know, rocking the whole world with, realistically. And then that more idiosyncratic sound that Genesis managed to, you know, take to prominence. Uh, so a little bit underground. I think quite a lot of people will probably know this one anyway, but this is one I continually go back to. This is Beyond the Beyond by Fantasy. So I have a question. So I I don't recognize the album cover at all, but the name of the band certainly does. Was did they yep. did they have any others? Yeah, this was the, the the middle of three albums, was what it was. Uh, this to me is the the pinnacle of the three. I'll be honest with you and say I'm struggling for names of the other two right now, um, because this is the one that I continually go back to. I've actually got all three. Other two are I think I have different. their debut. I'm pretty sure I do because yeah. that's got a much different cover. That's why I like, I, yes. I didn't recognize the cover, but the name of the band certainly. And I was like, oh, wait a second, what is that? So yeah, I'm pretty sure yeah. I have the first one. And that's really uh, good. Yeah. Yeah. And the, I would say this is better. Um, but the, this one, as I say, it, as happened with a lot of bands back then, a few machinations in the background and things didn't happen, lineups changing and record labels getting involved. So th this kind of trickled out as opposed to come out with a bang. Uh, and it's one of these ones that retrospectively people kind of go, this is one you should be listening to. And that's how I picked it up probably 
about 10 years ago, admittedly. Yeah. Um, but I do find that from that kind of era, this is one of the ones that I continually go back to. It's very good. If you haven't heard it, I think it's definitely well worth a listen if you like the sort of music we're talking about. Cool. Good pick. Even though I haven't heard it, I think it's a good pick because, uh, like I said, I am familiar with the band, just not that one. So uh, and I, I want to just throw this out there right now because I think when I announced that we were going to do this show, I had a handful of people like, I really hope the band England is going to be on your list. Uh, they're not on my list. I do love Garden Shed quite a bit. All right. Uh, but for me, Garden Shed is a cool little rarity, so to speak. Not quite the 20 you must hear first. If we were to do like another show with the kind of the more the, you know, the lesser known stuff that you need to seek out, different story. But uh, my first choice is from 1972. I love this band. This is the first album I ever got from this band. Um, they've had two different album covers. So I'm going to show you the, the UK album cover, the US album cover. Strangely enough, they put the same album cover as the debut, which made absolutely no sense. But I'm talking about three friends from Gentle Giant, I mean, I just love these guys. Nobody sounds like Gentle Giant. Uh, they're so English sounding, right? As you know, there are some of these bands who you listen to them and you know they're from the UK somewhere. I mean, it just, just bleeds through all their music. Gentle Giant, easily, but I love the way they mix like eclectic, eclectic, like chamber music, Baroque, rock and roll, hard rock, a uh, little bits of jazz, a little bits of blues, just kind of like everything but the kitchen sink. And it's so complex, yet so like catchy and different in a weird way. So, and, and this is a band who didn't have to do all the big long epics. They did them occasionally, but not like, you know, Genesis and yes, certainly and others certainly did but uh i just love this little kind of eclectic band of misfits and uh you know got got the three brothers early on and gary green on guitars and uh you know carrie Minear, just loving to death and uh could be you know people always ask me what's your favorite gentle giant album of all time i'm like i have never been able to answer that i have done shows where i picked one then i the next day I'm like, why did I pick that one? It should have been this one, you know? So I don't know. I, I, I fluctuate between like three or four of them that constantly rotate, but I love this one. Like I said, it's the first one I ever got great songs on here. Peel the paint prologue school days, working all day, Mr. Class and quality title track. All great. Love it. That's my first choice. Back to you. Great. And a great first choice. And I'm delighted because I haven't chosen any gentle giant. I'm not delighted because I haven't chosen any, but I felt that with you would think we're trying to narrow this down to 20 and 40 Hard. between the two. You, you would think, well, 20 albums is loads, but 20 albums is nothing. So there was one or two that I thought, bands-wise anyway, Peter will definitely have some of those, so I may veer somewhere else, put it that way. So yeah. I'm moving into what you would class as the modern era. Well, 1984. <laughs> modern in prog, I suppose. And a band that I've always loved. See... Scottish prog. This is what we've got here. This is Palace. This is the Sentinel. Uh, this is the band's, I would say, their seminal release. It's also beautiful. Um, yeah. And absolutely. Yeah, look at that, huh? Just, yeah, this just stunning. And then that's, uh, got, that's Rodney Matthews, right? Didn't Rodney Matthews yeah. do that? Too? Yeah. And you've also got some beautiful lyrics that are in hand scroll. So you can't really read them, but it's prog. So there you go. Um, <laughs> But yeah, and they've got a logo, which they didn't stick with, right? Yeah, but it's a shame. Yeah, and they've got all the stuff. But then musically, I love this. I mean, it's Neil Prog. There's not a huge amount of surprises on here, but at the same time, I think this, from that era, you're in Marillion class here at, at this stage, and there's not much else from that era. There's lots from the era. We could do a show on UK Neo Prog from, from this time as well, to be fair. We may one of these days. Um, but this stands above, I was going to say all else, but people will presume I mean million with that too, so not quite all else, but to me, there's lots of competition out there, so people will disagree, I'm cool with that, but I always come back to, to the Sentinel, I just absolutely adore this album, uh, and I just think from start to finish, it's as good as Neil Prog gets, love it, absolutely love it. 
Yeah, it's their masterpiece for sure. Yeah, I mean, you know, that era, we're looking at them. We're looking at Marillion and IQ and Pen Dragons down the road a little ways. You got Twelfth Night. You got uh, Solstice, right? Weren't they around also at that time? Yeah. So uh, kind of a cool scene bubbling under the surface there that uh, wasn't really getting much attention worldwide at all. But when you look back on it, uh, especially here in North America, everybody's like, oh, Prague was dead by 1980. But all of a sudden in the UK, there were a handful of bands that were like, you know what, Th this movement isn't dead. We're going to kind of continue on. And thankfully they did. And I think that really helped the 90s scene kind of take off as well, because I think the 90s scene was highly influenced by the 80s scene. Yeah, very much so. Uh, I mean, there was bands that kind of started to see this. I mean, Palace, they're back again and, and making some great music again, but they kind of went by the wayside. And a lot of the bands that did kind of set that scene never really kind of made it over the line into the 90s scene, IQ did. But there was bands like Galahad coming through that kind of flourished into the 90s. And that 80s scene, which really was quite a short period of time, it got credibility, lost credibility very quickly. Um, and was suddenly seen as very derivative after everyone kind of go, wow, people have been brave enough to do prog again. So, but it, what it did do, and I would say it set the scene for the 90s, but on into what we're still listening to now, because there's so much great stuff out there now, and I would argue that yes, no pun intended, a lot of it comes from the 70s, but I think without that kind of 80s revival, I'm not sure that that same influence would still be felt. I don't know if people would have gone back and listened to what influenced that scene, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. That's a good point. Yeah. All right. Uh, you know, this one's got to be here because if it wasn't here, I'm sure we'd get all sorts of hate mail, right? Uh, my number 19 again don't worry about where it's placed on the list uh 1973's dark side of the moon by pink floyd i know there are some people who don't really consider pink floyd prog but i think if pink floyd weren't the huge band and you know album sellers that they were people wouldn't have any question about it right uh, because i think there's a lot of like prog fans who like to think that you know prog can only be so successful to be great once it gets over that hump Nah, it's not really prog anymore, right? Because it's played on the radio and all that kind of stuff. Well, you know what? If it's radio friendly, ear friendly, progressive rock, I'm okay with that. And, you know, we all know this album well. It's one of the best selling albums of all time. It was on the, uh, you know, top 100 Billboard album charts for how many years in a row? And, uh, you know, it's a classic rock staple too. And that's how most people remember it. But a genius album as far as production and songwriting and, you know, the whole nine yards and uh, it's it's legendary for a reason. So it's got to be on my list. So uh, Dark Side of the Moon from 73. Absolutely. And very interesting point you make there because I'll mention it later on too. Pink Floyd, I think I've seen as passe now just because of that mega success. And they're, they're one of the few, even for the big boys of prog, household names that, I mean, everyone's heard of Pink Floyd, do you know? Yeah. And it's interesting because I can kind of join that up with what I've chosen. I was determined when we did this not to just choose albums from 1970s. It would be way too easy to, arguably it would have been correct to, okay? But me being me, I've got to 2001, okay? And up in arms, people will complain because our muse prog. Well, I think they are. It's progressive rock. It's great instrumental work there's passages there the thing that strikes me with muse is how they can take this music to the masses i don't really know do you know because I, i've been to see them two or three times the shows are huge and they're, they're bombastic they're spectacles in their own right but they're playing complex songs that have phenomenal musicianship time changes yeah absolutely and there's a lot of queen in there a bit of elo so some of that kind of soft prog that was really rock music but there's definite prog on these albums especially at this stage i think uh with origin of symmetry as i say 2001 um absolution and then also moving into supermassive black holes to me i always say it like that as if i'm singing this song uh, to me this was prog rock so why are they selling it in arenas in the uk uh, it makes no sense to me because people should listen to this and go what is this so I love them for that. I love the fact that, you know, my kids want to listen to this. Do you know, can we go yeah. see Muse now? Yeah, of course we can. <laughs> Why would we not? They're fantastic. So I, I just think this is, this is a great album. There's stuff like um, Hyper Music, Plug In Baby, uh, Screenager, Feeling Good, which is obviously 
one of their biggest hits. People knew it already. But as I say, this album should make no sense. And it's a, it, this should have been a niche product that just didn't make it big. And you can watch them on BBC One over here, which is bonkers, you know, because Pop Prog gets played on BBC One without getting sneered at. The UK loves to sneer at the prog rock scene now, by the way. So I love the fact this doesn't get sneered at. So yes, I'm sure there'll be screeds of comment underneath that this doesn't deserve to be here. What's he talking about? It's modern prog. It's UK. I love it. There you go. Yeah, I mean, yeah, they were in the right place at the right time. They had a, a record label that was fully behind them. They had some really catchy songs that they turned into hits. I've, I always thought that um, it's a shame that they had a label that did for them what needed to be done and Porcupine Tree didn't. Yeah. Because they were kind of contemporaries and you had Muse kind of really, you know, and Porcupine Tree kind of, mm, you know, why, why did it work for one and not the other? Well, uh, let's not get too deep into this because people can watch the Stephen Wilson, uh, the Future Bites video that we did and, and rage about my comments there too. Um, but I think that a lot of it to do with Mark Bellamy as a star, he's happy to sell himself as what I would call a snooker loop. Do you know, he's quite happy to put it out there and say crazy things for crazy reasons so that people go, he's crazy, but he's really not. Do you know, but it gets that notice, it gets people involved, they talk about him. And he is a star. He's got a look. And they act so, like stars, right? I mean, Muse, they, they wanted to be stars, right? Yeah, absolutely. Stephen Wilson, when you go and see him live, he puts on an art show. Whether you like it, whether you don't, he puts on an art show. Muse put on a circus. Yeah. And I think that's the difference. I love them both for different reasons. I could go and watch one one night and one the next night and get the same amount of pleasure from them. But one want to be stars. And I are still argue that one doesn't really want to be a star. He just wants to make lots of music. So, yeah. I think that's maybe, there's always artists that undermine themselves. I think Stephen Wilson does that. I think he's still doing it now. I think that's why people love or hate his new album. Yeah, exactly. That's a good point. All right, I'm going to go back, continue back in the 70s here for a little Aqualung by Jethro Tull. Arguably a strange choice for this list because, you know, is it prog or is it not? I think, uh, you know, obviously we know the album that came after this absolutely is. Uh, but I think there's enough of what later became the album that we'll probably talk about later, at least I will, uh, is on here. And it's it's a progression from where the band was before this. You know, the first album, all British blues. Second album, a little bit of blues, but more folk and hard rock. The third album, mostly a hard rock and blues album. This album brings together that majestical is that even a word? Majestical? <laughs> majestic yeah, story. No. <laughs> that majestic storytelling from me and Anderson, right? And the the really witty lyrics, the blending of the big hard rock guitars. Um, and you know, the, the keyboards are really coming into play on this album, the really complex acoustic guitar passages, the flute, the whole nine yards. All of a sudden, this is like, wow, I never heard anything like this before. And I guess, you know most people label this as progressive rock because it's like, is it truly a hard rock album? Eh, in spots, certainly. Is it a folk rock album? No, not really. Is it a straightforward rock album? Certainly not, right? So I've always kind of, you know, when it comes to Tull, they have certain albums in their catalog that I think are truly prog albums. They have some that are completely not. And I think that's always a big debate. You talk to Jethro Tull fans, they're like, oh, but that album's prog. That one's prog. That one's not prog. It's like, oh, Jesus, here we go. Right. You could talk about it forever. So I'm going to label this as a must have prog album. So, uh, yeah, the, um, this is my 18 on my list. Again, don't get too hung up on where it sits, but I love this album. It, it's got, I mean, all their... They're real classic songs around here. Title track, Cross-Eyed Mary, you know, Mother Goose, My God, Him 43, Locomotive Breath, Wind Up. I mean, God, any album that's got all that on it is like, oof. You know? So that's my next choice. Oh, 17 for me, as you say, numbers kind of don't mean anything here. And I'm keeping it recent again. This is 2013. You can tell from the heft that it's a fantastic Steve Wilson set. We've got The Raven That Refused to Sing. I adore this album. Uh, I think this is modern UK prog rock majesty right here. Um, yes, he's veered away from this since then, but this, depending what comes, I think will still be seen as a, his, his defining statement post Porcupine Tree more than anything else. Um, I just love the way that this album is constructed. Uh, I love the, the sound of it. I love his production, to be fair. How about um, that album cover? Yeah. 
absolutely. And <laughs> yeah, yeah, says it all, doesn't it? it absolutely, <laughs> says it all. yeah. No, no I'm, name I'm, on it, no, no title, nothing. Doesn't need it, right? Oh, you see that, and you're like, all right, that's a prog album, absolutely. I've got that on the back of a hoodie, and it's glow in the dark, and I love it. <laughs> <laughs> You're not going to buy that off the album rack and say, like, oh, this is a new black metal album, right? At least I think so. <laughs> Absolutely. So, yeah, I just think that this is a fantastic album. And I know that a lot of folk have, have an issue with Stephen Wilson and, and where he's at and various things. But if you haven't given him a go, start here. And then if you want to work somewhere else, then go forward or back, whatever you want to do. Is this prog rock? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's absolutely fantastic. Love this album. Yeah, as much as he wants to tell you that he's not a prog rock guy, that I mean that out. Come on, it's yeah, yeah, that's a good one. I, that's that's probably my favorite of his solo albums. I, I dig that one quite a bit. All right, uh, seventeen for me from nineteen seventy four, uh, Camel Mirage. And no, I do not promote cigarette smoking. No good for you, people. Um, as a reformed smoker from many, many, many years ago, uh, don't touch this stuff. But this band and this album is quite amazing. Uh, I know most people, they tend to, when they think of Camel or talk about Camel, they point to the Snow Goose, which was the big concept album they did right after this one. But I personally uh, love this album. Uh, I think this uh, this album rocks a little bit more than some of their other ones. It's got amazing keyboards, some great like epic tracks. You, know, you got the Lady Fantasy suite on here. Uh, you got the Nimrodel suite on here. You got Earthrise, which is great. Free Fall, Super Twister. Just uh, awesome, melodic progressive rock great vocals mostly instrumental though i mean you know camel for the for the most part especially early on were probably like 60 percent instrumental and you know 40 percent vocals which was fine because they were such good instrumentalists and long guitar flights and keyboard solos and all that kind of stuff just an amazing amazing album love the sound of it uh david hitchcock produced this of course he worked with a lot of prog bands back in the day but uh yeah i love it that's my it's my next choice yeah, that's, that's a great album and, and it's one that very nearly made my list. I, I must admit that I don't have any Tull, I don't have any Camel, you can write to me here and complain. Um, but partly that's because I, I did want to try and, I knew that we would choose some phenomenal stuff between us and we will cross over at some, at some points, I've absolutely no doubt of that. I've already seen one that I've got higher up on my list, but I didn't just want you have 20 and me have the same 20, not that that was ever going to happen, however, so that's why I've got a little off piste this low in the list. So number 16 for me, I'm with Alan Parsons. Oh, Tales of Mystery and Imagination from 1976. So this is a, bit, a little bit of a change of gear from certain things. Same again, is this prog? Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I think it's progressive rock. It's very smooth. Um, it's polished. It's a concept album, it's good enough. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> that, that'll do for me. Uh, I just think, that the, especially at this era, I mean, what came later down the line? Is it prog? Yeah, probably not, to be fair. But this this is a concept album. The instrumentation on this album is absolutely fantastic. And I do have it on vinyl, but I've, I've pulled out the CD version. If you've never heard that, I would actually argue you try and get one that's not been touched up because the modern ones have been touched up yeah. and they do kind of change it a little bit. It's still a great album, um, but I would advise you go back and listen to early ones. And I probably should have been less lazy and got the vinyl out as well, to be fair. Um, because you don't muck about with, with close to perfection and this is close to perfection so if you like that kind of synth sound it's an expansive album though it's not just kind of niche and it's not synth in the sense that you've got like say you know Schultz or Jarre or anything like that it's remarkably accessible while still being remarkably standoffish I think this album so yeah I really like Alan Parsons and I, I did to use, to use Swither, for want of a better turn of phrase, on whether they really deserve to be in this list. But to me, it's a prog album, and it's an album I go back to a lot. So, it is, so it's number 16 for me. I don't know if I mentioned, 1976 were in here. And I think they were reasonably groundbreaking for, for that era as well, to be fair, with this sort of music. But same again, taking it to the masses. But the 70s was a different time. Great album. Yeah. Uh, I You know, I... I totally agree that it belongs. And uh, I, I think their first three, four albums are, are you know what? There are bands kind of like Procol Harum, who I think were mm. at their core, a really good, like just regular rock or pop band, but they knew how to play their prog, right? I mean, they threw a lot of complex passages and instrumentation in there. And I think they totally fit. I don't have them on my list. I love your choice. Cause I, I, 
iRobot would was in consideration for me. I don't have Procol Harum on my list either, but I was thinking about them too. Um, but I am killing myself because right now I realize that there's one that absolutely should be on my list. And I'm like, do I just like get up and go grab it off the shelf? Cause I know exactly where it is, but then I'm oh, like, Oh yeah, go on Peter. Let's have 21. You can have 21. I don't mind. <laughs> all right. So I'm just going to throw it out there. All right. I don't have to go get it. Cause you all know what it looks like. I, I can't believe that I forgot super tramp crime of the century. Cause no, quite she's frankly, super- that's a top five or 10 for me without a doubt. I don't know how I forgot it. So it would, if I were to redo this lit and I, I was literally while you were talking for something you said, like kind of, struck something in my brain i'm like how the fuck did i forget super time <laughs> of the century and i was literally just going to go quietly sneak off to the back of the shelf and go Bloop! and then i'm like which one do i take out so i'm what i probably would have taken out in place of it but i'm it's that's an honorable mention should be on this list because whether you think super tramp is prog or not that album sure as hell is and that is just an amazing album start to finish classic album of all time so what what it would supersede here if I were to go and do that would be, and I love this album and I think it totally deserves to be here, is 1985's The Wake by IQ. Uh, for me, this is IQ's crowning achievement. And, you know, it's an early one too. It's what their second album, right? Um, and they would go on to do a ton of great albums after this. This is, you know, by no means their only good album. But this is the album that I think, you know, Stephen talked before about that early mid 80s neo prog scene coming out of the UK. And if you're talking about that scene, you got to talk about these guys because they were right alongside Marillion and Palace. And, you know, if, if you love late 70s Genesis, I mean, that's that's what this sounds like. It's just yeah. and, and Marillion did the same thing. They both kind of took that Gabriel era or the early Phil Collins vocal era in Genesis, like Trick of the Tail, Wind and Wuthering. Mellotron and synths and Hammond organ that was great vocals it's dark it's the tasty guitars very melodic love it and I love the artwork too so yeah that tied with the uh, super Tramp prime of the century is my it's my number 16 I can't <laughs> believe I forgot that album I'm like killing myself oh it's like well, unfortunately, neither of us have had Super Trump in their list, and I did consider them. They just never quite, but they could. And that's what I just completely gonna... forgot. I'm like, how, how do you? Anyway. <laughs> because the list of UK pro albums is like this. It's, it's enormous. Know? I know. Yeah, it's, it's enormous. Uh, we, could I mean, do we, could, we could do this again in two weeks, and we could come up with you know 20 new ones without even thinking about it, right? But uh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Back to so, you. For me, next, and I will get a little bit older after this again. Here we go. Porcupine Tree. I mean, anyone that's listening to me on a regular basis knows how much I like this band, Stephen Wilson. This to me, although there's so much great stuff before it and a little bit after it as well, this to me is, as far as prog rock albums go, because an awful lot of it before was a bit psych influenced and then there's a kind of period where they mellow out of that into this. But this is also quite a hard hitting album. This is Fear of a Blank Planet. This is 2007. Um, it's a comment on the modern world that's still relevant now. It's all about blankly staring at screens and various things like that. Uh, and I just think that this is a majestic album. When you've got the musicianship of, you know, Wilson, but Richard Barbieri, Colin Edwin, Gavin Harrison, it doesn't get any better than that, to be honest with you. And these guys are in demand all the time for specific reasons, and that's because they make albums like this. So if you're only really aware of Stephen Wilson now and kind of think, oh, what's all the fuss all about? Go back to here and hopefully you'll find out what all the fuss is about and then understand why acolytes like me are happily following along with whatever he's doing. <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember over the weekend when I was emailing you and I was telling you how we were trying to figure out whether we were going to be able to whittle this down to 20 and I said I had 22? Yep. <clears throat> they were one of them, the two. Okay. Yeah. 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 So um, I'm going to spill the beans right now. So Stephen and I talked before the show here, we are going to do after this one, probably maybe in a couple of weeks or whatever. Uh, for those of you who maybe know a lot of this, stuff, especially the stuff that I'm mentioning, know a lot of this early stuff, the 70s stuff and even the early 80s stuff, and maybe haven't followed the scene quite a bit, like in the last 20, 30 years, uh, we're going to do a show in a couple of weeks where we just, all we're going to do is talk about those bands that formed and came out after the, after the beginning of after 1990 and forward, because I think uh, there's a lot of really classic 
great stuff that it, that probably a lot of people have missed uh, from the UK prog scene that has come out since 1990. So we're going to do a separate show. Steven's doing a really good job of throwing out some newer stuff in, in his list, which is great. But I think we're both, because I felt bad, like overlooking some of that stuff, but I'm like, I, I went with my gut for the real, real classics, right? The, the things you need to hear first, but I think uh, we're, we're going to circle back and really dive into the more modern stuff, I think. So, uh, Anyway, I just wanted to throw that out. I was going to save it for the end, but I was like, it was a perfect time to drop that in there. So, all right, am I up? Uh, I'm losing track here. You are. Yes, indeed. All right, cool. Well, I talked about this band just a couple minutes ago and, uh, you know, how IQ was greatly influenced by another band. Well, that other band is here now. Uh, Nursery Crime by Genesis 1971. I love this band. I love this album. Uh, you know, 70s Genesis to me is one of the best bands of all time. And, uh, yeah. This, you know, Trespass, the album that came before it, saw the band really moving into the area that they would flourish in for the next, uh, you know, eight, nine, ten years. But this is the album where it all really, really happened. Uh, you know, the musical box, Return of the Giant Hogweed, Harold the Barrel, Fountain of Salmasis, Mellotrons, Gabriel, Hackett, oh my, I mean, it doesn't get much better than that, right? Uh, love the album, you know, the Paul Whitehead artwork. This just screams 70s progressive rock, right? You think of a 70s prog rock album, you, you're going to you expect to see a cover like that. And we're going to see some more Paul Whitehead in, in a little bit, I'm sure. But uh, I love this album. Love this band. This has, you know, this and another album and another album and another album. There's like four Genesis albums that always vie for my top spot. But, uh, you know, this is definitely up there. Um, we'll get to another one in a little bit. So uh, that's my neck. That's my number 15. So 14 for me, I'm going to show you an album cover, which isn't actually the album. Bear with me. So this is Comus, okay? Uh, so this is a kind of gathers all their albums together or, or the, the early stuff together. Uh, and their first album, First Utterance, which came out in 1971, is just something different. It's something else. In both kind of sense of that, it's something else. It's something different, but wow, it's something else. This is, is it psychedelic? Yes, no. Is it folk? Yes, no. Is it prog? <laughs> yes. No. Is it rock? Oh, yes. No. Uh, it's everything and nothing. It's weird. Yeah. The lyrics are quite demonic. Not devil worship and anything like that, but it's, it's an evil album, actually. It's quite it is. a difficult album to get <laughs> to know. It's probably the mellowest evil album you'll ever hear, right? <laughs> yeah. But it's unsettling. It's unnerving. It, it's a great headphone album. And if you get lost in it, you worry about getting back out again, to be fair. Um, and this was recommended to me, I was going to say reasonably recently, probably about five or six years ago, whenever I think this probably came out. Um, and I, initially I bought it and thought, wow, what have I done? <laughs> you know, another one of those ones that I've spent money on that you think, no, well, but you bear with it and you stick with it. And I don't just like it now because, well, I spent some money on it. So I, bet I, like, I like it because, wow, it's intricate and it's it's different. It's breathless. It, it's, it really is an experience. It's kind of like watching not a spooky film because it's evil other than that it's almost like watching a, a bizarrely beguiling horror i don't know what it is but i really like this album and i say from 1971 it stands out as genuinely something nobody else was doing this i don't know if anybody else has done this yeah. arguably does you know, anybody dare to is, i don't know <laughs> i don't know yeah absolutely are they mad enough to um and to be fair, some of the output from them is a bit, because eh, I've, I've gone further after this, and it's not all as involving as that, to be fair. I think when they hit the mark, they hit the mark. When they don't hit the mark, it's way over here somewhere. Um, but First Utterance, which you can get on Songs to Comus, um, I think is well worth a go, but be prepared for it to be quite a hard journey. I do think, though, that this is a must-tier UK prog album because... There's a lot of prog out there that, you know, fits the bill, does certain things, admittedly, setting the scene because they were the first bands doing it, but this sets the scene. First band doing it. Has anyone followed? I'm not sure. But I really like this, I have to say, and I've gone back to it more and more and more. And for an album that I initially thought, I don't know if I've ever listened to this again. I've listened to this a lot. So if you've never heard Comus, give them a go. I'd imagine initially you'll go, what is he talking about? Stick with it, because I really think that eventually you'll go, ah, now he's still, no idea what he's talking about. 
no, really good. I really like this. It's an you know why I'm laughing so much, man? Because it's like I have that exact same CD and I bought it under the exact same pretenses because of all people, Michael Ackerfeld from Opeth has been talking about that album for years and how that was one of the biggest influences on, you know, the beginning of Opeth. And I bought that because you can't you can't find the, the originals, right? And I bought that and I'm like, what the hell is this strange, evil stuff, right? But yeah, it's got some weird charm to it. It, it. it doesn't fit into any kind of box. It is prog. It isn't. It is folk. It isn't. Uh, and so many like black and death metal bands love that album, right? Because of the, the way they're able to craft that, that whole dark uh, lyrical, you know, imagery. And it's like, yeah, you would, it just goes to show you that you don't have to have screaming vocals and heavy metal guitars for, for music to scare the shit out of you, right? Yeah, absolutely. And that's a great, it scares the shit out of you. The first time you listen to this, there are genuine moments where you think, what is this? Yeah. Do you know? And, and that might be too far for some people. It's maybe not far enough for others, to be fair. But as I say, considering that this album is however many years ago, that is 1971. Wow. I mean, that's that's really putting it out there. Lots of other bands were putting it out there, but it's putting it out there. I, I really yeah. like it. It's, it's become a, a must-have album for me. I'm really there pleased to have it now. Are you a fan of uh, Hammer Horror at all? I don't know if you like horror movies at all. Yeah, I do like Hammer Horror. Isn't it? Okay. Of- so I love the Hammer Horror films. That would be the perfect soundtrack to The Devil Rides Out with Christopher oh, Lee. Yeah. Right? Could yeah, you imagine them playing that during the, the devil yeah. worshipping scenes in that film? Yeah. Perfect oh, yeah. for it. Uh, yeah, perfect. <laughs> all right. Uh, where are we? Number 14. So uh, this band released two albums, actually, in this year, in 1971. Uh, for me, they are, you know, this band's got a hand, another one of those bands that has a handful of albums that could qualify here. I gave myself the criteria. I'm not going to put more than two albums from any band on this list because otherwise, you know, the entire list of 20 is five bands, right? So I could have easily done that. I didn't want to do that, but I, I had to have this album on the list. Uh, it's 1971's The Yes album from Yes. You know, the first album with uh, Steve Howe, the last album for about a decade with uh, Mr. Tony K. Uh, it's a great album. I mean, it's got, you know, Yours is No Disgrace, Sharp, Starship Trooper, Seen All Good People, Perpetual Change, The Clap. I mean, classic, classic Yes songs. And this is the album where it all worked and, you know, for this band. And they finally figured out exactly what they wanted to do. You know, the first couple albums kind of hinted at it, but it all came together here. And it's, it's a must have if you're listening to UK prog, you know, from any era. So. Yeah, I I agree completely. It's not on my list. I'm delighted it's on your list because for the the same as you, I tried to keep it down to two per band, but there are, as you say, three or four or five bands that you think, actually, I probably could have filled the list with probably just about them and nobody else so yeah, I'm I, yeah i mean yeah exactly i have from those bands i did cheat a little bit though because I'm not giving away too much but two by any one band but i did have a rick wakeman solo album in there too so it's kind of cheating it's kind of not that's nah, not, not cheating that's nah, not, not cheating. there's any rules who needs rules so this is the six wives of henry the eighth this is 1973 not giving away too much this is the year i was born it's probably even better than I have, I think, to be fair. I mean, Rick Wakeman, I think, is very much viewed as a bit too cheesy in, the, in solo guys, but this is that's not what this is. I think this is fantastically arranged, fantastically composed. I mean, Wakeman's a composer. He's not just a fantastic songwriter, which he is, but he's a composer in his own right. And to be taken instrumental synth-led prog rock into the UK top 10, even in 1973. I mean, you take your hat off to the guy, or you can take your cape off to the guy, do you know? Um, <laughs> and I really like this. There's on the Rick Wakeman solo catalogue. I mean, you could fill those shelves behind you there, Peter, with the Rick Wakeman solo catalogue. Oh, like and 40 of them or something, right? I mean, it's crazy. There's more than that. Yeah, I didn't more than that? Oh, my God. I think he's put one out about one every seven seconds now, I think. And I mean, I mean, you've got to be, I love Rick Wakeman. He is, in his own words, a grumpy old man. But there's some fluff in there. By some, I mean enough to fill my belly button more than once. Okay, there's a lot of fluff in the Rick Wakeman catalogue. But when he hit the nail on the head, wow, did he hit the nail on the head. This is a fantastic album. It's a concept piece, obviously, a wordless concept piece. And it's absolutely brilliant. I love this album. It's remarkably current, you know, for for nobody would ever make this now, probably even including him, but it sounds 
remarkably current. So this is my go-to Wakeman outside of Yes. Uh, and I absolutely adore this album. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I would uh I would say out of all those solo albums, again, it's probably, it's probably got more than I've ever listened to. Uh, and I've heard a good chunk of them. I would say he's, from what I've heard, there's probably way less than 10 that I would consider even remotely close to essential. I would say five to seven are really good to great. And the rest, I'll say no more. Well, I think like a lot of guys at certain points, especially with the, the keyboard and synth sounds, once you kind of hit the 80s and kind of into the early 90s and things, what once was groundbreaking became twee. And for me, and others will disagree, Wakeman kind of got lost in that, I, I think. And, and he arguably, says me, I've never released an album. I think he kind of got lost in releasing albums against releasing great albums. And if you kind of condensed what he was doing instead of releasing them all the time, you would have more great albums. But... There are great albums in the catalog. Oh no, there absolutely are. Yeah, I'd say those those early concept albums he did are, you know, they're legendary for a reason. Yep. <clears throat> All right, and there's probably a bunch of people watching. It's like you know, mm -hmm. well, Pete, Stephen, when the hell are you going to start talking about the Canterbury scene? Right? You're not going to forget about the Canterbury scene. We are not because uh, in the land of gray and pink by Caravan, 1971. Got to mention this one. Uh, you know, I I have said not that long ago that I'm a fairly recent convert to the caravan camp. Um, I listened to this band. I had like a little collection of theirs for many, many years, never really listened to it that much and didn't bother, you know, buying all their uh, individual albums. I've done that in the last couple of years. And I will say I, especially their early albums, really, really good. Uh, I, I like the Canterbury scene because I think it veers a little differently from the yeses and the Genesis and the Pink Floyds and all that kind of stuff. It's quirky music. It's very jazzy music. It's playful, great instrumentation, love the vocals. It's just really different. And I really appreciate a lot of the bands from this scene. You know, we're talking like the Soft Machines and Matching Mole, Hatfield in the North, National Health. I mean, there's so many other bands we could talk about, but I have grown to really like this band, especially this album and a lot of the uh, their early albums. And I think uh, this absolutely needs to be on this list. If you are going to explore UK Prague, especially from the 70s for the first time, you got to have a Caravan album. This is probably the one to do it. Uh, if you've never listened to Caravan, just go right now, run however fast you can get there to somewhere where you can listen to Nine Feet Underground, the big uh, epic on this album. You'll love it. It's great. Uh, great Hammond organ uh, and nice guitar and uh, good stuff. So that's my next pick. Well, you kicked yourself earlier. I'm kicking myself now because I have no caravan on my list and I, I'm, I'm disappointed in myself. More than I feel I've let myself down, Peter. Caravan are, are outstanding. I, and to me, they're arguably the pinnacle of that scene. And that, that's that's a tough kind of crown to, to hand out because there's so many great bands from that scene. But I think consistently for a period of time, that they were just doing it slightly better than almost everybody else. Yeah, I, I would say if, if you're talking about the, the, the Canterbury scene, you know, Caravan and Soft Machine are probably the two most notable bands. I tend to, if I'm going to point someone towards definitive Canterbury style, I usually go Caravan, at least lately, uh, because I think Soft Machine, I love them, but they were, they were always more of a jazz band, right? I mean, and, uh, like an avant-garde jazz band, then they went to the fusion thing. So whereas I think that kind of playful nature of the Caravan, of the, the Canterbury scene is best exemplified by Caravan, to me anyway. But I love Soft Machine just as much, but for different yeah. reasons. And in fact, I, I, they were almost on this list. They were, they were one of the ones that had to go in favor of some other stuff that I'm going to show you here today. So. Indeed. Right, so for me next, more controversy because we're doing a top 20, whatever you want to call it, UK. So I'll just, I'll do that and we'll pretend that this album is definitely by a UK band because by this stage, King Crimson, I mean, King Crimson will always be a British band. But at this stage, they were a transatlantic band. So there's a little let's, bit of cheating. Let's be clear. Tony, I, I love Tony Levin. He lives near me. He, he kind of carries himself like a, like an Englishman, right? He looks like... Yeah, oh, he, come on. It's, it's, it. oh. yeah, so we can now say three quarters. That's yeah. it. Perfect. De definitely a British album. So <laughs> I, I absolutely love Discipline. He's this is another album. Sorry, but we'll, whatever. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, I, I mean, okay, the one that's not, we can't say he's an honorary UK 
native Adrian Ballou on this. I just think that the sounds that are coming out of this album, it's weird and it's wacky, but it's contained and it's pointed. To know this isn't someone just going, Let, let's be a bit out there for the sake of it. I really like this album. It took me a long time to appreciate. It's not one of the ones that I bought and thought, what have I done here? Because it wasn't what I expected. I mean, obviously I've gone back retrospectively into these bands, um, but it wasn't what I expected because the sound was different before, but there was still a, a progression through Ellie King Crimson. And then we get to this and it is just like something else entirely, Do you know, I, and things like Elephant Talk, frame by frame. And then you've got, you know, tracks like Indiscipline, where it's just, I mean, Bill Bruford on Indiscipline is just indisciplined. I, I mean, that, that's that's some serious percussive work that, that's going on there. And obviously, I mean, Fripp is just fripping it, isn't he? He's, yeah. whatever you want, I'll do, then I'll do it twice, and then I'll do it 10 times more. And that's what this album is. It's just, it's ladled on, and it's ladled on, and it's ladled on. But it, never at any point do you think, well, please stop. You just think, you oh, give me more, give me more. And that's that's what this album is. So I don't know how people view this. There are certain albums that I think that people will gravitate towards that are older than this one. But this is what I pull out almost more often than any other King Crimson. So I really like Discipline. It's an odd album, but it's also a really straightforward album, which is counter, it's a counterpoint, but I like that. Yeah, I would say it's a pretty revolutionary album. I mean, they, they they totally reinvented themselves for that album and brought themselves into the 80s in a really good way. And I mean, there, there's some stuff going on in that album that's just like mind-boggling, like the rhythms and the intricate guitar parts, but yet it all sounds so damn, like, accessible, yeah. right? I mean, that's that's the crazy thing. Yeah. I mean, you can sing you can sing the songs, you can sing along with choruses and various things like that. And before you know it, you've got, boing and guitars and sounds coming from over there and then it just picks you up and runs you somewhere else and then you're back in the chorus and you think we well, haven't had anything else in between what happened <laughs> so, I mean, like, tell but, yeah, as you say, it's, like, it's like so catchy and then but you listen to all that stuff that's going on underneath it i'm like oh man it's amazing yeah, yeah that's a great choice it's a, i know a lot of people actually yeah. who are king crimson fans and love the old stuff but they, that's their go-to album right there so speaking of mr fripp he happens to appear on this album that I'm going to talk about next. Uh, this is also from 1971. God, can you tell 1971 was a good year, right? Especially for uh, UK Prague. Uh, so this is a band. This was their, oh man, third album, fourth album. I'm forgetting exactly. I think it's their third, but maybe their fourth. And this is their big epic album. It's got only three tracks on it. And people love this album, love this band. They're definitely different from a lot of the other bands we're talking about, of course. Uh, and we got another Paul Whitehead uh, album cover citing here, Pawn Hearts by Vandegraaff Generator. So this is Peter Hamill and company with Mr. Fripp doing some lead guitar on here. You got squonk and sax and lots of organ and Peter Hamill's angst ridden vocals. Of course, you know, you've got uh, Plague of Lighthouse Keepers, Man Erg and uh, Lemming, uh, just a great dark prog nobody sounds like these guys i think i've said that before in the show already you got you got like gentle giant and vandergraaf generator two such unique bands and of course they don't sound at all like each other right thankfully uh but yeah, yeah. this i had to put some vandergraaf on this list and there's there's a bunch that i could have chosen but i when i tr when i tend to point people towards this band this is usually the album that first comes to mind they have another couple that are really up there as well, but I, I, de I definitely wanted to pick that one for today. So Pawn Hearts from Vandegraaff Generator. Excellent band, excellent band. So I've gone to Atomic Rooster for number 11. Oh. This walks behind you, that's where I'm at, although this is from the box set, which is sitting over here. So it's one of these horrible box sets that albums kind of run into each other and extra tracks go in between them. And But the music's fantastic. That's the bit that matters. Um, and this, that's the classic lineup for me of Atomic Rooster. I mean, you've had Carol Palmer and things in before, but this is John Ducan, Vincent Crane, Paul Hammond. And this is, I mean, with hindsight, it's heavy rock, it's heavy metal, but for the time, 1970, this was daring and different and bruising. This is a bruising album, do you know? It is uncompromising. But same again, there's still an accessibility in there, but you can almost, 
I mean, there's talk that they weren't overly keen on each other and all that sort of thing. You can almost feel the fight on the album, do you know? Who's in charge and who's going to take over? The organ should be at the front, the guitar should be at the front, so we'll do them both at the front. And it just seems to come together in a way that I think that had it been slightly more conventional, wouldn't have worked quite so well. There's lots of great stuff in their catalogue, but that's the one for me that I would say, if you need to listen to one, you need to listen to that. And everything's different in their catalogue too. They're a very difficult band to say, well, they sound like that, because they don't sound like that. But th this to me, as we say, is it prog? I think so, especially with hindsight, because who else was doing that at that stage? You know, there's other bands that were similar in about that era. And this was, that era was the beginning of that kind of big organ sound that was kind of taking over things and, and driving songs on. But that's a really great exponent of that. And I think it deserves to be in, in the list. Yeah, I, I'm kicking myself for forgetting that. And I'm thinking that maybe I just, maybe I just subconsciously didn't pick it. I'm glad you did because it deserves to be talked about um, because it is so heavy, right? It makes, see, for me, I always had a, I always had a hard time with Atomic Rooster because where did they fit? because they're like they're not they're not a deep purple or uriah heat because they're not always really heavy although that album is there's plenty yeah. of prog on their first three albums i'd argue right um yep. yeah oh great band yeah they're they're like they're another one of those like heavy ham and organ heavy guitar uh, bands like heap like vanilla fudge like uh purple like um iron butterfly right but so different sounding than all those bands yeah that's yep. a great that's a great yep. Yeah, I, I totally spazzed out on that one too. That's um, but I'm glad I'm glad you have them on your list because I think they deserve to be here. It's great because we're both we're, we're, I think we're plugging the gaps from each other here, so it's really good. Yeah, which works out well. Yeah, so um, right, I'm gonna go for kind of a different about face from that, uh, but just a couple of years after it, 1974, uh, another band that I really love and very different from I think every other band we're talking about today or we have so far, uh, Renaissance, Turn of the Cards. Annie Haslam and Company. I mean, again, another one of those bands that nobody sounds like them. You've got, it's prog rock, but it's gorgeous. Pop melodies, classically inspired piano, acoustic guitar, lead Rickenbacker bass, uh, the lovely vocals of Annie Haslam. I mean, some of their classic song, and, and again, they've got a couple classic albums, but this is my favorite. And this is, again, is the one where I normally steer people towards when I talk about Renaissance. I mean, uh, the Black Flame, Mother Russia, Running Hard, I Think of You, Things I Don't Understand, epic long songs, extended instrumental passages, but just absolutely majestic and gorgeous. This is not a heavy band. This is not, uh, they're bombastic, but more in a kind of like um, classical, like film score type of thing. And you got the operatic vocals of Annie, just a magical band, magical album. And how about that album cover, right? So uh, yeah, yeah, Turn the Cards from Renaissance. That's my next pick. I think as well that their influence is much more prevalent in the current scene than it ever has been. Yeah, I would you agree. Yep. So, yep. Bands that are coming through now that just kind of have that something about them that, that, that they could create. And it's interesting because there was a, I would say, really a decades long chunk where they were never really spoken about. And suddenly they've got a presence again and, and people are referencing them. And you can hear it in lots of current progress of music and, and that's a great thing because it looked like they were going to be forgotten about yeah i think you know back in the day i mean bands like renaissance and curved air which were you know two of the only really somewhat major prog bands with female vocalists uh that really wasn't that that wasn't done much back then now you see that all the time now so i think that both of those bands kind of paved the way for a lot of what we see today absolutely and you know now featuring the piano and those lush melodies and orchestrations i mean that you see that a lot nowadays right Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So for my next one, I'm going to 1980 and I'm going to Peter Gabriel 3 or Melt or whatever you want to call them because obviously everything was called Peter Gabriel by then. Even <laughs> album's not every by solo Peter album Gabriel. with my name, right? Okay, yeah. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Do you know? I mean, to, to vary things, I put live at the end of one of them, but anyway. So he's kind of on the cusp of what came before at this stage and then what's about to come after because we're heading into kind of accessible chart sort of stuff. But that's not what this album is, I have to say. I mean, you've got 
a lineup here. I mean, the lineup is is huge, but just to pick out some names, you've got Phil Collins playing on this, you've got David Rose playing on this, Robert Fripp yet again is on this, Tony Levin yet again, Jerry Marotta, Kate Bush shows up and, and does some background vocals. That's somebody else that could be on my list that isn't Kate Bush is phenomenal. Uh, and I just love this album, I have to say. Um, I listen to a lot of Gabriel. I'll still go back to a lot of his stuff, I have to say. But this is the one, as I say, you've got Beko, you've got Games Without Frontiers, things that have lasted a bit longer, a little bit more accessible. I mean, he still closes most of his shows with Beko um, for more of the political message than the song, although the song is fantastic. But you go through side one, Intruder, No Self-Control, Start, I Don't Remember, Family Snapshot, and Through the Wire. And that's not an easy set of songs. That's not just, you know, chorus first, chorus first, chorus first. It's not doing that. He's kind of viewed now as, you know, it's Peter Gable, he writes Sledgehammer, which I love, don't get me wrong, I love yeah. the Soul album. But this is doing much more than that. And you've got things like um, Lead and All Life on side two as well, which is was described at the time as a bit weird. <laughs> and I think that's a fair comment. It's, a bit weird, it has to be said. I just think the album's beautifully put together. Uh, and as I say, Gabriel, uh, there's a, an awful lot of stuff from this era now that with hindsight, we kind of go, yeah, well, you know, he was good, but not by that stage. And he really is the early solo stuff. And for me also the latter stuff too, but th this is it. This is really hard hitting in a variety of different ways. And there's also a German version out there, which a nice wee curio as well has to be said. So the third album from Peter Gabriel. Yeah, it's my favorite Gabriel too. I, 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 I applaud that choice. Great album, great album. That, that did fairly good business here in the states when it came out. Uh, they, they played Games Without Frontiers on uh, FM Rock Radio all the time. I used to hear that all the yeah. time. And I was like, I always thought that was such a great song. I'm like, what the hell is that woman saying there at the? On the <laughs> She's so frontier. What is she saying? She's so frontiers. What is she saying? Obviously, we know she said something different. But uh, yeah, as a, as a young young guy, I was kind of like, I love that song. I love Gabriel, but I don't know what the hell that woman's singing. But anyway, uh, my number ten. Uh, I actually talked about this on the Prague show we did last night about concept albums. Uh, Marillion's Clutching at Straws, the final al album with uh, Mister Dedek Dick, otherwise known as Fesh. Is that all right? Hey, very good. That's good, Peter. I'm that getting better. Good. I'm hanging around you way too much. See that. <laughs> You know, this is a concept album about, uh, you know, Mr. Torch and who's a down as luck singer. Uh, you know, the album is not the most uplifting album in the world. Look at that. Yeah, I wish I had that. I just got this, which is pretty cool, too. But yeah, you got the ultimate, yeah. right? And it's just a, it's a it's a great album. I It's my favorite Marillion album. I, I like the darkness of it, the seriousness of it. And, you know, we've talked about the Marillion stuff before together. But, uh, you know, Incommunicado is really the only big uplifting song on the album. The rest of it kind of like simmers along at a pace which i absolutely love so and a lot of my favorite marillion songs are on here so this is uh fish's last stand with the band sorry fesh's last stand with the band and it's my favorite and uh that's my number 10. well i needed to have marillion on my list and it was was it clutching or was it brave so i went with clutching because i do think that if you're going to talk about the must here that's the must here um and yeah i mean you've summed it up beautifully it's a dark arguably a depressing album do you know i mean it's not there's not a cheerful tale here this is fish bearing his soul talking about himself as he always does but not really uh, and it's just i think it's a remarkable piece of work especially with the kind of history of they come off the back of a massive hit album with big singles and didn't quite know where to go recorded an album that's kind of partly on on here in, in different guises that became what came after for Marillion and what came after for fish so what came shouldn't have worked. This should not have worked. This should not have been the album that it was. But yeah, I think from, from realistically from that neo prog scene, and yes, they've kind of moved on from it a little bit by this stage. This is where it's at, it has to be said. So I would guess that most people watching this know this and know Marillion. If you don't, well, get yourself sorted because you need to. Yeah, I totally agree. Yeah. All right, my number nine from 1978. Uh, had to throw this super group on here because I think this is a dynamite debut. And uh, the band I'm talking about is UK. All right, let me get that glare out of there. So of course, you know, John Wetton, Eddie Jobson, Mr. Bruford, Mr. Holdsworth. Does it get much better than that? Not really. No, <laughs> exactly, right? Uh, amazing stuff here. And 
you know, as we know, after this album, of course, Bruford and Holtworth would go move on, but uh, they would bring, instead of bringing another guitar player, uh, Eddie would just kind of take over, do keyboards and violin. That's going to be the soloist right in the band. And they brought in Terry Bozio for a very good follow-up as well. But I always kind of, I always kind of favor the debut. I mean, In the Dead of Night, do we need to say any more? Classic song. I just love the interplay between all these musicians and the, the great vocals on the album from Wetton. Uh, it's just magic. And it's just, it's a shame that we never got like a string of UK albums in whatever configuration, right? But uh, this is a must for anybody exploring UK, whoops, UK prog rock, right? So that's my number nine. Yeah. I mean, they were, as you say, a band that never fulfilled the potential because they never allowed themselves to. But that album is is something special. Not on my list, but it is something special. As I say, it's great because I'm looking at your list going, this was should have been on my list, was on my other list, but didn't make on this list. So I'm, it's great to see what's coming through. Yeah, it works out so, well. Yep. Yeah. Number eight for me, I'm going back to 1974. It's not everybody's favourite from this band. Some people hate it. Most people love it, I think, really, even if they don't admit it. So The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, I absolutely adore this album. Um, from the title track, everything. I mean, what's, what's not to love on this album? Why can't people love this album? Because some don't, I have to say. You know, they don't. It's, it is a bit of a Marmite Genesis album, and, and I don't really understand that. Do you know, it's just a, a great piece of work. I, I mean, I could pick out anything from this, you know. Flying a windshield, Broadway melody of seventy. Lots of magic on that album, Stephen. A lot of magic I mean, on that album. Yeah. The, as I say, the lesser stuff off here that just people saying, oh, "Well, they were a bit up themselves by this stage," and, and Gabriel was getting a bit lost and all these various things. But this, this really stands up for me now. You put it on now; it's still an exciting and invigorating listen that demands your attention. Yeah. And just doesn't let it go. It's uncompromising, but it's catchy. It's got choruses, but it's intricate. Do you know, and it's also for me, I think, highlights. I think we forget sometimes of what came after with Genesis, just how damn good they were. You know, mu musicianship wise. Do you know, because what came after once Collins was singing, and I still have all, all of those albums. I still like all of those albums, including even things post Collins, like Calling All Stations. But we forget just how damn good these guys were, do you know? And this, to me, maybe too introverted, for want of a better turn of phrase. But I really like that about this album. It's a statement. It's a real statement album, and I think it really still stands up. Yeah, I think that album is always, you know, the the whole idea of what if, what if they would have stayed together in that configuration and continued on, because that album, and, you know, that is one of the greatest albums of all time by a band that was about to lose, like one of their main members right yeah. and the fact that it, and he was going through such a inner turmoil about where he wanted his career to go and his unhappiness in the band they cranked that out and then he's like okay i'm done and this is like what and you know what i love about that album too as compared to and uh, which is why i think um the lamb is a different listen than some of the albums that came before it is that is a double album that works because it's a whole bunch of shorter tracks all put together to tell a story as opposed to, you know, a 15 minute long song and an eight minute long song. I mean, there's a couple of them on there that are a little lengthy, but it's all these great little pieces put together that tells a great story. And I think yeah. it really, and it demands your attention. Exactly. Cause you're not going to get lost in a 22 minute Epic on that album. You can't, they don't let you, right. They move on from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next, and they carry you along the entire way because you don't really know what's coming next. Yeah, it's remarkably daring for that reason, I think, because yeah. you do put it on and you are, I think, consistently jarred and jolted because it moves you from here to there to, to something else to, to let's go back here. And it, as a lot of great albums do, it calls you back to something you've heard before, but it doesn't dwell on that. I think that in terms of arrangements that I'm going to get a bit lost here because there's so many great arrangements that they put together, but I just love the arrangements on that album. It's such a clever thing. It could easily have collapsed under its own weight. Yeah. For some people it has, but to me it really didn't. It's fantastic. And I'd say out of, uh, arguably, out of all the Genesis albums with Steve Hackett on them, some of his best playing is on that album. And I'd yeah. also say that some of Tony Banks' best textures keyboard textures are on that album as well and he's got and, and these guys have great stuff on all the other albums they did together but there's something about like everything just really gelled on the lamb which is which is just great so all right my uh first trip down king crimson avenue is uh gonna be here at number eight with uh, red 
All right. So, uh, you know, again, another one of those bands that I could have had five or more albums on this list. I had to kind of, I chose two. I think I kind of already spilled the beans and showed another one earlier. But yeah, I mean, this has got some of my favorite tunes. It's got Starless on it. It's got the title track, Fallen Angel, One More Red Nightmare, Providence. I mean, just think about that. That's all it needed. And every song just absolutely kicks ass. And again, another perfect example, just like we just talked about, of a band that's like falling apart at the seams when they release this and then they're done. And this would be the last album we'd hear from this, this, this lineup, from this band. And it's just like, that doesn't always happen. I mean, you look, you go back, and again, I'm not going to piss off a lot of people here, but you know, you go back and look at one of my the most beloved bands for me of all time, uh, Black Sabbath. You know, Never Say Die, which was the last album with Ozzy for many years. I mean, you could tell that band was breaking apart at the seams. Yeah. Who do we think we are by Deep Purple? You can tell that band is breaking apart at the seams, right? I, you know, I know a lot of people love those albums, but do, do the general public consider those the greatest albums they ever did. No, but yeah, arguably you could say this is the best King Crimson album that ever happened. The Lamb Lies Down on Broadway, you could arguably say is the best album that they ever did, right? And that band was splintering apart at the seams at the time, or at least one of their main members. So uh, yeah, Red is my choice for number, where are we, number eight? Yeah, so uh, I love it. Gotta, gotta have it if you're checking out this whole genre of music and from this country. I completely agree. Uh, number seven, I have got another one that you've mentioned earlier. So. Dark Side of the Moon. Oh, yeah. yeah. Um, and yeah, so just a great album, has to be said. As I say, Floyd kind of it gets lost in, in the... You're the prog band for non-prog non lovers, right? Yeah, that's the, prog, the prog band for non-prog fans. Right? Yeah. I don't really yeah. like prog, but I like Pink Floyd. <laughs> yeah, I mean, they kind of suffer from, from what is a phenomenal visual because that's now just on t-shirts it's one of those it's a, an ironic t-shirt almost it's like you see people wearing acdc t-shirts have no idea who bon scott was do you know what i mean and all this sort of stuff and that's what pink floyd have become but this is just a stunning album i mean you've covered it already but it's a fantastic album and it's still it's a, another cleverly constructed album which was kind of the norm back then i suppose and that's maybe another bit why the mystique is, is not quite there with it yet and certain moments of it arguably are overheard now. You know, if you put on Planet Rock or whatever over here, you're going to hear songs off this and one of my other choices, arguably too regularly. But as an album, it really hangs together. But I think it deserves a reappraisal more yeah. than anything else. It's a great album. And one of the greatest headphone albums of all time, right? I mean, this yes. Alan Parsons engineering that whole thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And another album that arguably is, is one of the best headphone albums of all time and uh the first appearance from either one of us on this list of this band uh coming in at number seven for me from 1973 a uh, little brain salad surgery from emerson lincoln palmer i mean you know that uh carnival nine multi-part epic is uh arguably one of the greatest things that this band ever did but you got jerusalem on here takata the lovely still you turn me on which i absolutely love uh, i could do without benny the bouncer but the rest of the album is absolutely stellar and essential and you know for me, when it comes to ELP, it's either this or Tarkus. It's interesting because for me, Tarkus is so great because of the title track. And I feel that it's got a couple other decent tracks, but that's like the strongest stuff on there. And, you know, whereas this album, I think, has the one kind of dud of a song for me anyway, and the rest of it's just really, really good. And also another great, uh, you know, kind of, uh, it's not the title track, but it's like the big kind of epic on the album. But yeah, I mean, for a trio, these guys make a lot of noise and some glorious noise, I would say. So uh, yeah, there you have it. Brain salad surgery from uh, Emerson, Lake and Palmer. I'm probably going to get some hate because I've no ELP on my list, but that is a phenomenal album, has to be said. And that, that's what I'd have chosen as well. If I was going to choose an ELP, it is that or Tarkas. But as you said, that's that's the one that's I think the real deal. It's a full album, yeah. and it just well, maybe one exception. It just doesn't let go. I think. Yeah, you know, it's funny uh, when you talk about ELP. I think I think perhaps perhaps their strongest album, start to finish, might be their first album. But it doesn't quite have the big essential tracks that some of these other ones do. Right? It has a couple of them, but I uh, I don't know. I just for me, you know, Brain Salad is just got to have it. Got to have it classic so for me number six i think we're at number six i'm going back to 1967 and the same again it's the argument is it prog is it not but i'm going to days of future past from the moody blues i mean this is a concept album 
continuous pieces of music. You've got a rock band here. You've got orchestral passages in here. By modern standards, it's very gentle. Do you know, it's, it's maybe a little bit too gentle for a lot of people by modern standards. But back then, 1967, how many bands were doing things like this? Do you know? Yeah. And that, that to me, that's, that's, that's as prog rock as it gets in, in, in those terms. Do you know what I mean? Justin Hayward, John Lodge, Mike Pinder, Roy, Ray Thomas, sorry, Graham Edge. This, this is the, it's a classic lineup. It's a great band. Yes, you've got Knights in White Satin on here, but the whole thing, it's the day begins, dawn, the morning. It's a journey. This is a real album that takes you on a journey. And I love, this is a great headphone album. Yes, there's an either thing about that too, because obviously the, the stereo and the mono and all this sort of stuff doesn't necessarily trans, translate in the same way in modern ways. But I really think that's an album that you can get lost in. You can step inside this album. Uh, and I just think it's beautiful. Arguably, some of the albums that they released after this are more prog. But to me, this is where it began for them. Really and this started, is, yeah, yeah. yeah absolutely. Uh, it's certainly where this journey started because they'd done stuff prior to that. It was more of a pop band than anything else. Yeah. But realistically, this is, and I think it really stands up. Do you know, as I say, it's gentle by modern standards, but they're just really good songs on here. Um, and I think the Moody Blues often get lost in the shuffle, do you know, because they're not bombastic. They're not so intricate with their musicianship that it's kind of about the, you know, here comes the solo, but they're writing great songs and there's lots of little interplay between all, all of the band. Uh, and I really like this album. It's one I continually go back to. And this is a, a lovely ex expanded set. It's, yeah got all the fancy in the booklet and the poster and various things so yeah it's it's a good choice excellent. yeah uh, they didn't make my list but i i yeah i if we were expanding this a little bit they would have easily been on there and quite frankly that's probably one of the first ever like symphonic rock albums even yeah. though it's lacking some of the dynamics of bands that came after it i mean you got to give credit where credit's due right um and you know I, we could talk all day about what the first like true prog album was um that's got to be in the discussion. It has to be. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it lacks, I suppose, the bombast right. that you can expect from prog, but I think that's more symptomatic of the era in which it was recorded, because you've got to think about what the limitations and things were back then, do you know? But to be combining the elements that they were and giving you those musical passages, they're thinking beyond the pop song. We're in, we're in the mid-60s here. Yeah. Do you know, it's the era of the, of the pop song, and they're thinking way beyond that. And yeah, they weren't alone. Lots of other bands were doing it too, but that's the one that's always stuck with me. I really like that album. Yeah, that's a great choice. I dig it too. I like all those, that era from the Moody Blues quite a bit. All right. Uh, number six for me from 1977. Uh, a little more Pink Floyd love here. Animals. It's my favorite Floyd album. It's uh, a great concept album. It's only got a handful of songs. It's got three main long tracks, two shorter ones that uh, that bookend the album. Glorious, one of those albums for me. I can't listen to taking a track off of it. I have to listen to the whole thing, start to finish, each and every time. Uh, love the concept of it. It's pretty twist, you know. It's, it's very again, it's very English, right? I mean, you you know, uh, this is all about all the wacky stuff going on over there in uh, in Britain and the corruption and all that kind of nonsense. And uh, but musically, it's just magical. And it's a kind of creepy album at times, too. I mean, this is not like a fun, you know, this is not Dark Side of the Moon. This is a totally different beast here. And this, I guess, foreshadowed where they were going to go with The Wall and with uh, the final cut. And But uh, I love it way more than any of those other albums. I just think that Animals always really spoke to me quite a bit. I like the different vocal styles. I love Gilmore's guitars, both electric and acoustic on here. Great haunting keyboard tones love it just i'm a huge fan of animals love it for me animals is where waters begins to take control but still lets everybody else in yeah do you know after that i do i love what comes after too but after that i think that pink floyd became his band until it became not his band yeah. do you know um and interestingly because where i'm at next is and yeah okay playing it safe but it's wish you were here and that this to me is almost before they're his band it's still much more collaborative at, at this stage I think he's still probably the driving force to, to be fair and same again I think this actually suffers from having Shine On You Crazy Diamond on it not because there's anything wrong with it because it's a stunning song 
that is just, I mean, the solo on it is just fantastic. The vocals on it are, are phenomenal, but people have heard it too much. And I think because of that has become, as I say, passe more than anything else. But I, I just think that the whole thing, welcome to the machine, you know, have a cigar, um, just really, it ticks all the boxes. Um, is it my favorite Floyd album? Yeah, today it is. That doesn't mean to say it will be again tomorrow because, and I can go beyond Waters as well because you've got the division bell and things like that, which is it classic Floyd? No, but it, it, it certainly it scratches a certain itch for me because I quite like the, the Gilmore era where it eases off and becomes a little bit more languid in certain ways. But this, this is an album that kind of strikes the balance between what had come, what was then to follow. But yeah, I think, it, it, as I say, it kind of gets lost in the shuffle a little bit. It's a phase of use for, for a few albums because I think that we've got a tendency, I've got a tendency sometimes to view things through current, you know, perspectives. And the current perspective is that this is a, a one-song wonder that you hear too often. But it's a great album, a really, really good album. Yeah. And I think we forget that to some extent. It's one of their handful of timeless albums. Yeah, I mean... Yeah. We could have filled the show on them, realistically, let's be honest, but there's another three or four bands you can say the same thing about. Yeah, absolutely. All right. The top five uh, from 1972. Uh, another appearance by my beloved Gentle Giant. How about that Roger Dean artwork there? And for folks of you who bought this album from here in the, in the U.S., that's the album cover you got in the U.S., right? Which is still pretty cool, too, right? This octopus in a tiny jar, right? Um, but I, I, I dig the uh, the Roger Dean uh, artwork. I mean, this is, uh, you know, one of their most beloved albums by the fan, by the fans. But it's 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 a very complex album. And I mean, where these guys were musically at this time was just like just completely out there doing things that no other band had ever done before. The advent of Panurge, you know, uh, the whole Knots, Boys in the Band, Dog's Life, uh, Raconteur, Troubadour. I mean, just great vocal interplay great musical interplay you know you got the the violin and all the keyboards and the guitars and the, uh, you know uh, just all these different instruments just kind of weaving around each other to the uninitiated you know i, I know plenty of people who have listened to general john be like what is that i don't get it right you have this a band you you're not going to get on first listen i remember the first time i jumped into the discography of general john i was kind of like yeah i don't know about this but after like a little while it's like Oh, I totally know about this now, right? So, uh, yeah. So this is for me. Again, it's hard to pick favorite or must hear Gentle Giant albums because they have a handful of them. But Three Friends and now Octopus, I think you got to hear if you're diving into UK prog, especially from the '70s. So that's my number uh, number five. Yeah, I mean Gentle Giant were a band coming from when I was younger, very much a hard rock background, slowly but surely investigating prog. That album in particular, bought it, put it on, and just went, yeah, just went warm straight past, didn't connect. Nobody and I would say, it, nobody like them, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it took me years before I thought, ah, now, now I understand. It took me to mature, <laughs> mature, no, <laughs> to understand what they were doing, you know. So, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a great pick there. It's a great pick, as was one of your previous ones, which was read by King Crimson. Um, I mean, you've covered it beautifully. The band, I think, had actually split before this even came out. Yeah. Um, so just a, an implosion from within, which really doesn't come across on the album. It does a little bit. You're talking about the lamb with Genesis, and it, it kind of comes across there. It's a very sort of, I don't know, there's like an argument on that album, if that makes any sense. This is such a smooth, beautiful... I mean, it's still King Crimson. It's still uncompromising. It's still you know, it's going to do what it's going to do. You just, the journey through this album is just fantastic. And, and the the structures and the the strings and just the whole journey through that album is just absolutely fantastic. And there's a theme, you know, from what comes on in, in my list, but he's also Bill Bruford features. I would, without looking into this, and somebody can probably tell me differently, maybe features more on my list than any other one musician. And that, that's impressive for a guy that, you know, sits behind the drum kit. I'm, I'm an ex-drummer, so I'm not going to put them down, I have to say. Um, but yeah, I just, this was an album where three guys together and a great cast of, you know, brass players and various things just clicked. It just clicked. And the compositional standard on this album's off the charts. Yeah. Really. 
Yeah, I mean, Bruford, one of the best, one of the greats of all time. Absolutely. Absolutely. All right. So once again, we're going to revisit another band that's uh, already popped up on my list. Uh, this could be their greatest prog rock album. It's a concept album. It's uh, basically a 44 minute long track. Thick as a brick. Jethro Tull. All right. A concept album uh, about the life of a young kid named Gerald Bostock, who, of course, you know, this made up by in the, in the mind of uh, Ian Anderson. But uh but you talk about bombastic, right? I mean, this has got it all. It's got, you know, the, the lovely acoustic guitars from Ian, the big riffs and solos from Martin, uh, you know, John Evans, Hammond, Oregon, uh, you know, Barrymore Barlow's drums. I mean, you know, the whole band just absolutely killing it on here. And it, you know, when was the last time you listened to a 40 some odd minute long track and said, wow, that's not boring at all. And it just kind of grabs you and takes you through the whole ride. And you're like, all right, let's do that again, right? That's that's thick as a brick for me. So I love it. It's, uh, you know, it, it's not, it's oddly enough, not my favorite Jethro Tull album of all time. It's up there. It's in the, it's a top three, but I think it is their best and certainly most deserving progressive rock album. So that's my number four. Number three for me, talking Bruford. Bruford's here again. So we're 1971, obviously with Yes, we it Fragile. I'd guess that most people watching this don't need me to tell them anything about this album because, you know, we're at that stage now where th this is where it's at. It's just a great album. It's a great band. It just does everything that you want it to. It's symphonic. It's beautiful. I mean, roundabout, you know, long distance run around. All of it. It's Outside just, of the sky. Oh, hell yeah. yeah. You know, I mean, I could, you don't just name all the tracks, but you could name all the tracks on this. And it's a real, it's a beautiful album as well. And the thing that strikes me going back and listening to this album, maybe even more than something that's a little bit higher up, is it doesn't sound antiquated. This sounds really fresh and vibrant. And I mean, I, John Anderson's a love him, I hate him kind of vocalist. I absolutely love him, you know, and he's just soaring on, on this album. But the, the it's not just the level of mu musicianship in this band, it's the way that they talk to each other as they play. You know, there's a real conversation between the instruments, there's a real understanding. They've all got an ego, we know that. They've all got an ego. They all want to be in the limelight. And they all get well, they all those solo pieces on there. It's like, oh, we could do some great songs together, and then we can do well, here's so here's what we can do on our own, right? <laughs> yeah. that, that, absolutely. And that was the strength for me was they they wanted to jostle. There's a real fight here. I mean, we all know how much they love each other, hate each other. But this to me is almost almost where that love hate resulted in perfection. So yeah, fragile. Great choice. Great choice. All right, another appearance uh, from my beloved Genesis Foxtrot. You know, if it, if it wasn't for, you know, two other albums which are coming, this would probably be my favorite prog album of all time. And it's my favorite Genesis album of all time. And, you know, any album that has Watcher of the Skies and Supper's Ready, Get Them Out by Friday, and Can Utility and the Coastliners, and never mind the rest of it, uh, amazing. Mellotron's Galore, Tons of Ham and Oregon, 12 string guitar, Moog, Moog, Taurus bass pedals, electric guitar, great drumming, great vocals, love it to death. It's complex, it's eerie, it's beautiful. It's kind of all these things and more. And uh, again, more Paul Whitehead album cover art. So there you have it, Foxtrot, my number three. Well, my number two is Genesis. There you go, Sell England by the Pound. 73 again here. I mean, 71 to 73 just covers so much of, of what we've spoken about here. Uh, as a guy that used to thump the tubs, as they say, Collins on this album is just yeah. off the scale, you know? Dancing with the Moonlit Night. I know what I like in your wardrobe, first or fifth. I mean, he sings on More Fool Me. You've got the cinema show. This, I mean, okay, this is my number two. As we didn't rank them in numbers, but this is my number two. It's just a great album. But as you said, I mean, you've chosen two Genesis albums that I haven't. I've chosen two that you haven't. I could easily have chosen the two that you did. I've literally just gone and thought, well, what two do I go to most? The Lamb 
and certainly England by the pound of the two that I go to most. Are they better or worse than the two you've chosen? No, is the answer to that. Uh, you, you, you chose the two that I wanted to include that I couldn't, yeah. right? So that, that covers all my four. And that's no disrespect to Trick of the Tail of Wind and Wuthering because they are worthy yeah. as well. But I, I mean, as we've said a few times now, there are three, four, five bands that you could easily have just filled this entire list with. And we, you'd be better just doing a show about those bands if we wanted to do that. So that's why we, without really talking about it, we both limited it to two. Uh, and we just happened to choose a different two. But I could easily have chosen a different four from two that I chose, put it that way. But this is a great album. Yeah, exactly. All right. Uh, well, it's coming back again. So uh, in the court of Crimson King, my number two, you know, arguably, you know, we talked about uh, Days of Future Past by the Moody Blues as being potentially the first like prog or symphonic rock album of all time or, you know, in history. Uh, but perhaps the album that prog actually became like in other words like the album that perfectly i think set up where prog was to go that's probably a better way to put it is this one uh this album is at times savage it at times it is breathtakingly beautiful and emotional and I, this album to me has aged like a fine wine i mean i get more enjoyment listening to this today than i did 20 30 40 years ago and it's just you know 21st century schizo men hit you like a hammer you know, what band was doing stuff like that at the time? Nobody, right? Then the lovely I Talk to the Wind, which is kind of jazzy. Epitaph, which to me is just heartbreaking and one of the most beautiful songs ever. I mean, Greg Lake's vocals just kill me. All that Mellotron on this album. Moonchild, The Court of the Crimson King, again, dramatic and emotional, almost painful to listen to, but you'll love it, right? And uh, the Mellotron on this album is amazing. The, and the instrumentation is kind of jazzy in spots and they're just, they're coming from angles that nobody ever expected. And, you know, again, this lineup wouldn't last, right? Another one of those great lineups that just like, you know, released like what, the two albums. And by the time the second album came out, they were already kaput, right? So, um, and that cover, right? So that, that screams prog rock, I think. So that's my number two. Certainly screams anyway, that'll cover certainly yeah, screams. Know, he's screaming something, right? I don't know what he's screaming, yeah. but he's screaming something. Yeah. See like, all the back of his throat there. Yeah, he's scared and I'm scared. That's a phenomenal album. It's neither, I, it was neither of my choices for, from King Crimson, but arguably that's the album that you should go to. I know that's what we're doing here, but that and uh, Lark's Thumbs and Aspect, which is not either of our lists, that too. Yeah, I wanted to fit that one, yeah. Yeah, any of the four that we've mentioned, what have we mentioned? Three we've mentioned because we both chose, chose red. Really, you, you could easily go there and that's seminal stuff. So talking of seminal stuff, it's Close to the Edge by Yes. Just get it out there right now, man. <laughs> Number one on both of ours. Had, yeah. we, did, we didn't rehearse that, by the way, people. No, we didn't. No, we, didn't. we genuinely did not know what, what was on each other's list. We haven't kind of said all the way through, well, you choose this and I'll choose that, and together we'll have a, a great list of 40. We've only crossed over with, with a few, but I agree with everything you've chosen. There's a few I've kicked myself with that you, that you chose I didn't. There's a few I've kicked myself with that neither of us chose. So, you know, because this was so difficult, and then ironically, we both end up, well, it's not ironic. It tells you all you need to know, doesn't it? Do you know, it sets the standard for, for, for progressive rock, for UK progressive rock, arguably for progressive rock beyond UK, I would say. And same again, you can just jump into this album at any stage and there's not a fault. There's not a fault. Anderson, Howe, Wakeman, Squire, and that man, Bruford, yet again. There he is again. <laughs> <laughs> he is again, um, and the, the, I know that that's arguably the classic lineup, arguably not the classic lineup, depending on which part of yes you, you really like, and I really like all of it. But yeah, they can just do no wrong here. They can just do no wrong. Take it away. Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything you said, and uh, I have long been saying that this is not just for me. I just truly feel that this is the greatest progressive rock album of all time, just because it does everything and gives you everything that you want from this style of music, right? You've got the opening epic title track, which has got all the bombast and all that intricate playing that this lineup did so well. You got the absolutely gorgeous and you and I, which so many bands that have done great things in this genre know how to do that big lush, 
you know, orchestral type uh, of, of, of piece that, you know, gives you, you got the Mellotron and you got the classical and acoustic guitars, you got the, the amazing bass playing, those gorgeous vocals, and you and I has all of that. It's mysterious, it's majestic. And then you've got the kind of rocker on the album, right? Siberia Katru, which is mysterious, rocks hard. It's got the, you know, Wakeman's keyboards just unbelievable on there, that intricate bass and guitar interplay. I mean, it's just, it's a magical album. And, and again, you know, it's only three tracks and each one is lengthy, but the album itself is like, what, less than, it's like what, 38 and 40 minutes long, if that way, I don't even know what, what's the total on this. It's, it's not over 40. So it's like the perfect length. It's such an yeah. epic album, but it's like, it's it's an easy listen. Yeah, absolutely. It's just, it's interesting because I've been listening to a lot in recent times, a new transatlantic album. And that to me, We've, we've listed however many between the two of us, and I stand by every one on my list. Your list is phenomenal. But to me, you look here, and this is still not just informing and influencing, it's directly making albums sound certain ways right now. Do you know? And I'm not diminishing Transatlantic there. Please don't think for a second, because I haven't actually written my review yet, because there's so much to digest just on the two versions of the three that I've heard that they're a phenomenal band is it the defining statement arguably could be but without this i don't think that they, i don't think they are more than yeah. anything else you know what I mean? it's the blueprint for everything we've been listening to for the last you know 40 some odd years yeah yeah, Absolutely. yeah. we both yeah. you know mentioned earlier stuff and various things but that's where it kicks in that's really where it kicks in that's where a, a defining sound is laid down for everyone to follow and they have they've absolutely followed yeah. some Slavishly so. <laughs> you know, it's funny to bring up Bruford again. So the, the crazy thing is that somehow he felt suffocated and bored with the music that they were making after that album. I'm like, what? Yeah. You know, it's, yeah. Like, it's, it's like, this isn't challenging enough. Granted, where he went next, obviously, as we know, dialed it up a notch with King Crimson. But I mean, this is not safe music by any yep. stretch of the imagination. But he felt limited in that band crazy as it sounds yeah. right that, that, that's quite astounding isn't it i suppose but that's sometimes you can't see the wood for the trees you can't see what's happening round about you more than anything else but same again he's i mean not always his fault to be fair but just about everything that he's gone in that has just gone like that yeah. hasn't really lasted long that lineup hasn't really lasted very long afterwards but even what he's kind of done and said in recent years i still kind of think he looks back on all of this and kind of goes nah. yeah you know and why not if you can do what he's done and you know what after that why would you not just go well that's just what i do <laughs> what i do is what i've done eh, you know some fun stuff yeah. made some good albums eh, i don't think he regrets anything he's ever done and he's he's yeah he's he's an interesting character bill bruford um I, you know he's just uh when he felt it was time to move on he moved on and uh there was, I don't think he was ever, with the exception of maybe when he did the Union tour with Yes, I don't think he was ever a guy that was in it for the money. And to him, he felt like if he wasn't expressing himself artistically enough at the time, he went and found something else to do. Yeah. You know what? Yeah. You got to respect that. Got to respect that. Yeah. And if you've got the, the talent and if you're in demand enough to be able to do that, well, why wouldn't you? Why, why would you not get to the end of a career? and yeah. say, do you know what, I actually, I ticked all the boxes. I feel yeah. fulfilled by all of that rather than, you know, we made some great albums and made lots of money. He did that too. Yeah. So who can argue? Great musician, but and involved in some phenomenal albums, as we've seen. Absolutely, legendary ones. So there you have it, everybody. So we've got uh, not quite 40, because we we duplicated just a couple, just a couple. Yeah, not many. Got probably, what, about 35, I would say? I, I don't yeah, know. Something there. like that. Of your go-to, must-hear, must-have UK prog albums. Again, we covered from the, the 60s all the way through the modern day. We were pretty heavy on the classic period, obviously. But don't fear. Don't fret. Don't worry, because Stephen and I will be coming back in a couple of weeks to give you our uh kind of recommendations if you kind of stop listening to this to prog rock by like the mid late 80s and you really haven't listened to anything new we are going to take this one step further and we're going to give you some recommendations of bands that have been releasing albums we'll give you specific albums post 1990 
there's a lot of good stuff. So this, I have a feeling this might even be harder because it's like, you know, we want to make sure we don't miss any really notable things. As opposed to here, you know, we knew we had all these classics that we had to try and squeeze in. Now it's like, all right, we got to make sure we pull out all the really great nuggets that have come out in over the last, uh, God, 30 years. Ugh, where's the time going? Yeah, where does the time I'm going? getting yeah. old. Holy crap. Yeah. <laughs> We're sitting here talking like 1990s recent. <laughs> Oh, Lord have mercy. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching, everybody. Visit us on the web at www.seatranquility.org. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter. Of course, we're here on YouTube. All the damn time. That is correct. So uh, stay tuned. We got more stuff coming on the channel and uh, Stephen will be back over the next couple of weeks. I got a couple other projects for him. I think I'm going to get him started on. So uh, stay tuned for that and more and uh, we'll see you real soon. Take care, everybody. <laughs>